Tony Dorsett. We'll talk about his Hall of Fame career and Ricky Williams' run at Tony's collegiate record. But first, we check in with Sports Center for a look at today's headlines. Gary, we're aiming. On this edition of Up Close, he's number four in the NFL's all time rushing list. Tony Dorsett tells us about his days in Dallas, watching his son follow in his NFL footsteps, and what it was like watching Ricky Williams break his collegiate rushing mark. TD, Tony Dorsett, Up Close. From the ESPN studios in Los Angeles, here's Gary Miller. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for watching Up Close. We're very pleased to welcome in Tony Dorsett to our studios once again. And Tony, you know, now we introduce you as the fourth all-time leading rusher. Uh, does it hurt to go down that ladder you know, a little bit? Hey, Gary, what a difference a few years makes. You, you know, <laughs> in 90, when I retired, I retired as the second all-time leading rusher. Now I'm fourth. Probably get ready to move back another notch this, this coming season with Emmitt Smith. He's real close uh, to surpassing me. Uh, on that list. Uh, how does that affect you? It felt well, better to be number two, I guess. Well, right? it, it, it would have been better being number one, but of course I couldn't couldn't get that that far. But uh, uh, it doesn't bother me at all. You know, I, you know, I understand that records are made to be broken. You know, I I may have had my run at it, had a lot of fun, enjoyed it, um, and unfortunately, you know, that's that's just the nature of the beast. You know, that eventually somebody's going to come along and pass you or surpass everything that you were able to do. You mentioned Emmett Smith. Now you, you get to watch him. Break your mark. How much more does it mean to be the Cowboys' all-time leading rusher than some other team? Well, you know, uh, uh, when we were back in that era, you know, the Dallas Cowboys were, I guess, quote unquote, America's team, and uh, being the, the leading rusher on that team for so many years uh, meant a lot to me because I felt that I brought a lot to the picnic. You know, we were successful, and for us to be successful, we had to have a running game going, and, and I was the focal point of that running game, so it, it meant a lot to me. You said bring a lot to the picnic. How much of a picnic were those days? It was, you know, some things came out in, in book form long after those days uh, were actually lived by you guys, but uh, how much of it was a great big party and how much of it was too much of a machine and couldn't really enjoy yourself? Well, we, we had a lot of fun. You know, when I first got to Dallas, you know, I was, I was a little bit surprised about, about the serious nature, seriousness of the players and, and not so much during game day, but during, during the week. You know, Tony Hill and I came in the same, same year and Tony and I would like to go into practice and make practice fun and have fun, laugh and joking and all that. And, and all the other guys were pretty, pretty uptight and it was like, man, hey guys, you guys got to loosen up a little bit, man. I mean, I mean, it's not game day yet. So eventually that uh, Tony, Tony Hills and, and my, I guess, attitude sort of rubbed off on the other guys and we made it more fun. And therefore, I think it, it really showed during the weekend, you know, guys weren't so intense and, and they got a chance to relax and it's found out that a lot of guys played better during the, during the weekend. Was most of that tone set by Tom Landry? Absolutely. I mean, when you looked at the Dallas Cowboys, you saw a reflection of Tom Landry. I mean, the seriousness of, of Tom Landry. I mean, as far as our preparation was concerned, we were probably prepared be as well or better than most teams. Tom Landry knew every position, uh, every assignment of every position, offensively, defensively, and kicking game. And I thought that was pretty astonishing for a head coach. Normally you have a head coach, you know, they're defensive-minded or offensive-minded, but he knew every position, every assignment of every position, and he really, really prepared us well. Did you ever, you know, you said you wanted to, you and Tony wanted to go have fun, lighten these guys up a little bit. Did you ever crack him up? Did you ever see him let his guard down? Once or twice, you know, he would he would loosen up a little bit. But, you know, and, and it taught me a lesson, too, you know, because uh, from his perspective, you know, uh, my rookie year in particular, you know, because I was lackadaisical at times out on the practice. I mean, I'm having fun. If I go out and, and a pass came to me, if I dropped it, you know, I was just, I would laugh about it, make fun of it or something. And, and he called me into his office one time um, um, my rookie year, late in the season, because it was I didn't start until the 10th game of the season, my rookie year. And he told me, you know, what he had thought about me and thought that I would be starting by this time and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to him and I said, Coach, you know, I've pretty much written this year off and was going to come in next year, try to compete for a starting job. And he just told me, he said, Tony, all you need to do is go out on the practice field and be a little more serious about what you're doing and uh, you'll get out there and start for us. And fortunately for me, I mean, I'm glad I had that conversation because of the fact that we were going the 10th game of the season just happened to be back in Pittsburgh. We were playing the Steelers and I got my first start. When guys went away from the mold, though, did they not last long? You know, if they weren't as gifted and talented as you? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, it depend on, who, depend on who that guy was and how much, again, as I said, he brought to the picnic. I mean, uh, i seen Coach Landry tolerate a lot of things from Thomas Hollywood Henderson. Yeah. But Thomas Hollywood Henderson was a guy uh, that had some leverage. I mean, he was a player that, that played. And Tom Landry, 
Yeah, he knew he knew in order for him to be successful, you know, he had to keep those type of people around. But when it became such a disruptive force, that's why you saw what happened to to Thomas Henderson in midseason that Coach Landry decided, okay, enough is enough, and and, and cut him. Another guy who's a good friend of yours, Ron Springs, who they used to call Edie. Yeah, Edie. <laughs> Edie. He said, Edie, I mean business. Because <laughs> <laughs> he looked like Edie, I mean, the great dictator. Yeah. But he was a guy who liked to have a good time. Yeah, he, 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 he did. He still does. As a matter of fact, Ron's a good friend of mine. But I'll never forget his rookie year. That's how he got the name Edie. We were leaving training camp for our first uh, preseason game. And he came out with a daishiki on, man. I mean, daishikis, nobody wore daishikis back in that time. They were kind of like... Uh, they fade, fade, to explain fade, to our audience what the They were kind of like fade, fading out a little bit, and, and Ron came out there. We were like, Ron, where, where are you going with that dashiki? <laughs> but uh, he, uh, uh, anyway, you know, but he was he was a guy that um, he was kind of like the life of the party. He was a locker room lawyer. I mean, he kept a lot of a lot of people loose and and and, and in stitches as far as laughing because we had a place when we were over there off of Forest Lane. We called it Ghetto Row. And it was it was a bunch it was of all the black. It was all lockers, black players' right? lockers there, and, uh, and you come down through there, man. There's no telling how abusive they would be to you, but we had a lot of laughs. Uh, you mentioned Ron Springs and his. Well, now, what is explain to some of our audience what a dashiki is? Well, a dashiki is like just like uh, just one of those oversized shirts, man. They come, you know, you put it on, and it may come down to to your knee level, and it has all these old freaky designs in it, man. Very colorful and stuff like that, and it was it was just. It wasn't very fashionable at that time. At the time, though, minks were very fashionable, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When did you stop wearing minks? Um, I, I don't... Uh, when you're talking about minks, you're talking about minks coats? Yes. Oh, well... Okay. Going out of your sports car and well, making a scene. Okay, Matt yeah. Miller once said about you, well, he's the slowest walking, fastest running guy I've ever seen in my life. I, and I'm still the same way, man. I walk very slow for some reason. Uh, you know, I was always uh, conserving energy. But, uh, you know, I, I, I really went into the mink coats. You know, I, I did have a fur coat, but uh, I didn't wear it very often, man. And uh, actually, right now, that coat, uh, I'm going to give it uh, to, uh, to charity. As a matter of fact. They could put it in a display case somewhere. Well, I don't know who would want to come see that coat. <laughs> <laughs> Another guy that you played with, because I want to take you through a few names of Ed Tutal Jones. Yeah is a guy who, he was a confirmed bachelor all of his life. He, he did a little boxing. Yeah, a little boxing. But this is a guy who you saw, you didn't hear him say much, but this is a guy who also liked to, to carry on a little bit and, yeah, and was a ladies' man. Yeah, he was a silent assassin, you know. He, he was a guy that went about his business very, very professionally. Um, I don't think Ed missed, missed a game in his career. I mean, he was a guy that played with a lot of pain. A uh, guy that I feel belongs in, in Pro Football's Hall of Fame. I mean, he caused a lot of havoc. He played on the strong side for us on that defense and that flex defense, which I'm not a strong uh, uh, backer of that. But still, I thought it, it, it took away a little bit of the aggressiveness of players. But it, for him to play in that position for so many years and do the things that he's done, you know, I thought he was a great player. But, yeah, we had a lot of guys, you know, when you talk about uh, – Ladies, I mean, we had a lot of guys that wanted to go out and and have fun. And back then, you know, uh, you know, your America's team and, and you're winning games and you're going to Super Bowls. I mean, that attracts people, and and females are a part of it. Do you think as much went on with that team as the recent Cowboys had been accused of and made headlines <laughs> for that just either got buried or the machine was able to like stifle the uh, media outlets? Um, I don't, I don't think we, we, we did anything uh, on the level that the guys were, uh, have been accused of or caught doing uh, uh, in this era. But we all had our fun. Uh, I think the book North Dallas 40, you know, that was before my era, but I think that was a little fabricated a little bit. But, you know, a lot of things go on in professional sports when you get a lot of guys together. They all like to go out and have a good time. So we did the same thing, but not of the magnitude that's happening today. You know, back then when you were a player, the Million Dollar Saloon was a place that guys would congregate at and have a good time at and do pre pretty much ran the place. Yeah. Were you surprised the reaction that, that your establishment got uh, in the era when it was named off limits by Jerry Jones to think, hey, you know, when we were players, this was kind of the accepted way to be. Well, yeah, that, that's rather surprising. And, and I find it kind of interesting that, um, you know, you'll get your owner or your coach and, and they come out and tell you where you can and cannot go. I, I understand if there's some undesirable people there or some bad things happening at a particular establishment, but to say that, hey, you're not allowed to go here, I think, you know, 
uh, we do have some constitutional rights, and, mm -hmm. and that is an infringement on your constitutional rights. But uh, things happen, man. And, 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 you know, but one of the things that I'm seeing today, Gary, that it's, it's a little surprising that you're not seeing guys learn from other guys' mistakes. You know, when you see someone else close to you getting, getting themselves in, in some type of problem or trouble, why would you in return do the same thing? I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just mind-boggling to me to see the way things are happening. Isn't some of that the athletic mentality, though, especially at the pro level of, of an NFL player that says, it'll never happen to me? I'm invincible. I'm invincible. And, and that's what happens. You know, money, money uh, is power. And so, you know, and when, you, when you're out there playing, you're high profile, you kind of feel you may... It, it, may, it may have happened to him, but it, but it won't happen to me. And that's the same thing with injuries. I mean, I, I felt the same way. The longer you play, the more invincible you feel you become. I mean, I thought I would never get hurt, you know, because my going into the, uh, to the NFL, I said maybe four or five years at the most, and then, you know, that came and, and, and went, and, and I'm, st I'm still playing. I got to 10 years, and I'm like, man, it's not going to happen. And lo and behold, you know, in my 13th season, I go out, nobody even touched me. I make a normal cut, and I just blow out my knee. Yeah, and missed only six games for a guy who's not of the size of some of those guys who you're up there with in the yeah. echelon of Hall of Fame running backs. We're just getting started with Tony Dorsett. We'll continue and talk more Cowboys football all the way up to date to the current and, and the newest threat to his running records. Ricky Williams, the Heisman winner from Texas. We'll also talk that Heisman fraternity up close when we continue. More draft aftermath as the minicaps get set to open. And we find Lawrence Phillips preparing for the World Football League is still dealing with anger. When we return up close, we'll talk more with Tony Dorsett. We'll reflect on his Cowboys past and Roger Staubach, as well as what it's like when all those Heisman winners get together. Hall of Famer Tony Dorsett, and I'm going to talk to you, Tony, about a guy who may someday join you there in Canton, Ohio, a guy who you had the pleasure of watching run, not maybe breaking your record, but Ricky Williams, very much in that Earl Campbell mold, you know, has that powerful mm. build about him and... Uh, you know, your impressions of this guy as he comes into the NFL. <clears throat> I'm, I'm very impressed with Ricky as, as a runner. You know, he, as you said, he's in that mold of, of an Earl Campbell. I mean, he's about 5'10", about 225, 230. Very fast, elusive. He has great vision. He is a strong runner. He can break tackles. Um, uh, and he can go the distance for you. But, uh, you know, his decision-making process, I, I admire what he, did, he does on the field as well as the things he does off the field, you know, meaning that, you know, he made a decision to go back to school, uh, to be a part of that college experience, to help his classmates and his, his classmates finish up on a positive note, uh, note there at the University of, of Texas. And, and what a way to break a record, man. I mean, if you had to pick a way to do it. Yeah, a big or, touchdown about, run. Uh, a you... big run like that, you know. And, and it happened, it's, and, you know, I was just standing on the sideline there, and I was talking to my buddy Richard, and I said, look, you know, uh, you know, when I broke the record uh, some 20, 22 years ago or something, you know, I broke it on a long run. I said, wouldn't that be ironic if Ricky didn't? And two plays later, bam, there he goes, man. And, and I was probably, besides his mother, I was probably the, the second happiest person in that stadium for Ricky to see him Why? be able to, to accomplish the feat that, that he set out to do, you know. And, and, and I admire that. I mean, this guy was uh, setting out to, he set that as, as one of his records that he wanted to do before, you know, him leaving the University of Texas. And, and for him to do that and do it in the manner that he did, I was very happy for him. I guess you felt it was inevitable, maybe not in a run like that, you know, once he got that close, yeah. but some of us would think that don't have the abilities that you or Ricky Williams have, think, you know, I'd like to hold on to this darn record and uh, think, how am I going to look like I'm really excited for him to break this thing? You, you couldn't help but get excited for, with a run like that, you know, the whole stadium was was excited, and, and the thing is, you know, I, I held on to it for 22 years, and it was good for me, you know, it, it gave, you know, it showed a lot of people, it, it like brought Tony Dorsett's name back to the forefront, and what it did was show people of his era uh, who Tony Dorsett was. I mean, it brought me back. Some kids, um, some of the people uh, down at, at going to school with him probably do not know who Tony Dorsett is or was, uh, uh, you know, as far as a college player. So from that standpoint, you know, it was... Let him good. go! He was running so fast, man, you can't keep him on tape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you look back at film of, of Pitt or in your Dallas days, what goes through your mind? What kind of memories does it bring back to you? Man, it, it's great, you know, because I feel... In, in some ways so detached now from the sport because, you know, I, I'm moving on with my life into new arenas and doing different things, but uh, to sit there and watch it, you know, um, 
I, and I, I hate to toot my own, own horn, but I, I feel it, I, I was, it was, it's impressive, you know, to see those things. And I'm saying, man, I was, I was able to do something like this. When I was playing it, I really didn't pay much attention to some of the moves or some of the things, the runs or things that I did. But, you know, when I get back and sit back in, in my den and, and put on a tape or something with some of my friends, man, let's see some video. And I put something on, man. It's uh, it's amazing. What do you put on? And I, when they it ask it you makes me. It makes me. It makes. I got. A, I got a tape uh, that was done for me by the University of Pittsburgh. It was called. Um, uh, was it run for the Heisman or run to the Hall of Fame or something like that? And what they did it chronicles my my uh, my college career and some of my my professional career. It was run to the Hall of Fame is what they call it, yeah. And so it was it's a, it got a lot of great runs both collegially and professionally. So it's it's a uh, it's very entertaining. You never get tired of looking at it. Brings, it brings a smile to my face every time I put it on. <laughs> What's that Heisman fraternity like? What's it like when you get together with fellow Heisman winners and? Sort of rub shoulders and say, "Hey, we're in a very exclusive club." It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great time. You know, we, and I started about maybe five, six years ago, going back every year to to the the ceremony. You know, and guys kept telling me, "Come on back." But it's a great fraternity, man. There's a lot of interesting people that are that have won the Heisman Trophy. A lot of guys that care for each other. Uh, as you said, it's 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 a very prestigious uh, fraternity, and it's a, and it's an opportunity for you know when we go back to New York, we all have a good time. Uh, we have a, you know the little dance that they have there the the, the night of or after after the the Heisman uh, ceremony, and everybody's there having a wonderful time. And also, it's an opportunity for us to network and do some things from that from that perspective. When you guys get together, well, why did you resist going back all those years until just a few years ago? I, I don't know. I just I just. I just didn't want to go back, man. I, for for whatever the reasons were, I just didn't didn't do it. And and I would see Earl or, or Billy Sims and some of those guys, or Steve Owens, and man, you need to come on back, come on back, come back to the family, you know. And and once I did that, I was like, man, I've been missing something. So you know, um, I won't miss another one. When you do get together and you get a room full of Heisman winners. Who runs the show? Who dominates a get together like that? Well, you know, uh, you got Hopalong Cassidy. I mean, you, you got some of these guys go back from back in the day, man. But, but way back, it's normally it's the, the older guys that they're really to steal the show, you know, because those guys are, are the guys that, you know, they got their more, I, their wisdom, and, and you just sit there and listen to some of the things that, that they talk about. And of course, they, they're like fishermen, you know, they got a lot of great stories to tell you. Hopefully, you don't believe them all. <laughs> <laughs> now, which stories do you tell? I don't. I don't tell any stories, man. I'm. I'm a guy. Pretty much. A, I'm pretty much an observer. You know, I sit there and and watch everybody and listen to all the things that are going on. And uh, I'm not a very talkative guy like that. You know, I don't. I don't. I'm not good at telling stories or telling jokes. But we we got a lot of guys in that fraternity that can do that pretty good. Well, let's talk about one guy. Let's hear a story maybe that you could tell us about Roger Staubach, a guy who you associated with in your professional career, who we hear so much about. His public image isn't much further from his private. Right? I mean, knowing him personally the way that you had an opportunity that most Americans wouldn't, yeah. what do you know about him that you could reveal to us that maybe people don't perceive? Um, no, I mean, he's a prankster. I mean, he's, really? he's, a, he's a joker. I mean, he, he, he likes to, to joke around and have fun. But what you see, you know, um, you know because when we were America's team, uh, you had uh, Tom Landry, then Captain America, and Roger Starbuck, and, you know, you thought it was just squeaky clean. And uh, but he is a guy that you know he's a great great father, great family man, and he's a great businessman. If if somebody I, I would want to have a child of mine uh, modeled himself after, I would say a, a Roger Starbuck would be a good person. I mean he's he's a great guy and a guy that would lift, loan you a helping hand at uh, any go given moment. I mean he's a guy that we've had a lot of guys that has played with him and maybe before or after that have gone to him, you know, he has a Starbuck company that's very, very successful, and he's put people, giving people, uh, players or ex-players jobs, and, and just, mm -hmm. just being very helpful. And anytime you need a bit of advice, you can call him. He's more, more than welcome to, to help you out. So what you see is what you get. Absolutely. It's not, uh, it's, it's more, not, than, yeah. not more than you can believe. It's, that's the way he really is. That's the way he is. Well, we've got a few more minutes left with Tony Dorsett. We're going to talk more about uh, some of the great careers that have crossed uh, along with his, there you see a pitch from Roger Staubach in the great number 33 headed downfield. Headed to more up close after this. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, a part of the Go Network. Go.com. Welcome back to Up Close. We continue with our final couple of minutes with Tony Dorsett. You know, there'll never be another Tony Dorsett, but there's an Anthony Dorsett <laughs> that plays in the NFL. 
for the Oilers. Yeah. Uh, he hasn't had the same success that you've had, but you do occasionally get to see him play for the Oilers. What's it like to watch your own son following your same career? Well, I, I guess you can say I'm still in the NFL. I'm living the NFL indirectly through him, but I'm, I'm very proud of him. You know, Anthony played one year of high school football. You know, he, I would never try to force feed him sports, and all of a sudden he got bit by the bug and he wanted to play. And to see him uh, progress in the manner that he did as far as, you know, when you look at his age group and, and the, the window of opportunity for him to go from that high school year to professional football is a very short window, but yet he worked his butt off. I, I've never seen a kid uh, work as hard uh, at something as he did, and, and so that's, that's what I'm very proud of him for. You know, he, I would come home at times and, and I would see video, I'd turn on TV, there's a videotape of uh, Roy, uh, 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 Daryl Green, Deion Sanders, all the top defensive backs, uh, Rod Woodson, he, he was studying them. And so he knew where he was at physically, so he figured he had to learn some things from, from some, some of the great defensive backs, and, and I'm really proud of it. we only got about 15 seconds left, but you're so well-spoken. You speak your piece. You make great television. Why, haven't we, why don't you have a higher profile in broadcasting? <laughs> We're working on that, too. You know, I want to take a few, few interviews and see if I can do some things. I like to be, be an in-studio analyst. You know, that's the thing I, I would love to do. Okay, well, one thing you find out when you get to that level, we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> but it's been our pleasure to have Tony Dorsett up close. Good. Thank you. And we thank you for watching this edition. I'm Gary Miller in Los Angeles. Stay tuned now. Sports Center up next. <laughs>